So let's start with, okay, Ivy, we we sinned. We didn't turn the thing on for five minutes. So now I got to do some backup. Um, we're talking about what pieces of art uh, Hume would like and wouldn't like. And so far we've got, go ahead, Leah. So we've got um, color, no, we'll leave color planes for Kant. I can bring up others. So Leonardo da Vinci's works, because they are incredibly skillful and mo a lot of them have human subjects. I didn't realize I used a second hand there. So I just saw a hand go across the screen that scared me for a second. Um, so Leonardo da Vinci is something Hume would most likely like. Um, then I brought I just, up- I just said that Hume, it would be hard because you want to rip away the religious uh, content, right? Yeah. So you got to really train yourself not to think about the story, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I brought up Andy Warhol because though Andy Warhol had vision, I think that Hume would look at it and be like, that is unskilled art. There's no refinement or taste that went into it. It's just, it just is. And then we talked about the degeneracy of, of uh, Warhol and, and Western culture. Um, and then I wanted to make the swap, swap to literature because there are more art forms than just the visual medium. And I think you would like Pride and Prejudice because it, it is human and it has this, even though it focuses on high society, there are, are you know, um, faults with the people and it was a skillfully and like well-written piece, even though many people think problems with it um, and a lot of people don't like it. And then you take, you have like Winnie the Pooh that is just incredibly straightforward and it could, it though it is, a well-written thing, and it is such a universally known character for a reason. It is too straightforward, and it doesn't have too much deeper meaning other than the typical like fairy tale, like these things are bad. Um, okay. And then I, oh, and then I, I think, I think that a weird thing that I wouldn't be able to say whether or not he would like or not is Grimm's fairy tales, because they focus on the human. They are often well written. They. Um, they can encapsulate small parts of culture. So it does take an education to get them in. Um, but they are this incredibly straightforward thing where it's more like they take an idiom and then they just expand it to an entire story. And so that's that's kind of where I, I don't know where he'd take it. And I feel like Winnie the Pooh is on one side and then there's a lot of other stories that are on the other side where he would like them like Animal Farm, I feel like he might, he would either love or hate Animal Farm, but I don't know. I, I think he might like it just because it is, even though it is straightforward, it's still well-written as a, um, this kind of ramping up of, of Snowball and all the characters. And I, I so Grimm's fairy tales are kind of where I want to talk about because I don't, I don't know where Hume would fall on them. Well, you want to give an example of one of the fairy tales? I'm trying to think of, I, my sister has this huge book of them. Um, Rapunzel. Who is, who is Rumpelstiltskin with? Yeah, okay, Rumpelstiltskin. Because I feel like that one is, is a good one that he'd look at and be like, this has a lot of different meanings. And there's not really, there's like the slight magical context um, but it's, it's about promises and deals and, um, what is it not being greedy, like most, like a lot of other fairy tales. Um, but it's also, a, it also has elements of family. And I think Rumpelstiltskin is, is an entertaining story that can be taken at face value or it can be looked into and analyzed in a dozen different ways. Um, and then I, oh, goodness gracious. I don't remember the original Snow White. So all I can think of is the Disney one, but I, <laughs> if any, I didn't know there was any, anyone other than the Disney one. <laughs> I think there is one. <laughs> Probably. I was like, Disney didn't make that up, right? It was a real story. Yeah. I think, okay. I'm getting a little I think um, Snow White, right? The dwarfs were grumpy, sneezy, whatever. 
yeah. it's very it's very humane, right? She enjoys yeah. them. They have these very human qualities, and she, right, appreciates them. I yeah. think little, I think it little, is about humanizing humanistic relationships. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I think you can look in, yeah, so Snow White is, is a Grimm's tale, but I don't, I remember nothing about the Grimm's version. So that might have been a bad example to pull up. Um, Cinderella is also one, and I think I remember more. Yeah, so a little twist in Cinderella is that the, uh, the stepsisters cut their toes off and like cut off the back of their heels so that they can try and fit into the shoes. Um, and I think that Cinderella is one that is so straightforward and simple that it's just a tale of kind of like, you got your comeuppance because you guys were mean to me. And I feel like that one he wouldn't like, because though it is written and it is written in the same style as, and kind of, um, what is it? And it's a similar, it's just similar to Rumpelstiltskin as in like, you know, a little body mutilation and revenge and then come up and I feel like it is it is less than Rumpelstiltskin. So I think I think Grimm's fairy tales are just kind of all over the place. They could fall on either side. It just depends on how you look at them. Okay, well I I did study those under Jung, Jungian that they're myths, right? Yeah. Fairy tales. Folk tales. And what do myths they describe patterns in human life and yeah. human behavior, but they're based on the assumption that we have these natural desires for good and evil that are never going to go away. And so they're educating for the mistakes that we tend to make all the time, right? Yeah. Um, competing, these uh, three women are competing for the princes, you know, and how did Cinderella get in her situation? Was envy, greed, pride, you know, and you got it. This is what I really want you to understand. They really thought they were going to re-engineer human nature, right? And all those stories assume the only way is through education for people to choose to reject these irrational passions because the temptation for them and some people acting on them is never going to go away. It's just you have to hope enough people will sort of be aware of that temptation and resist it. Does that make sense, Leon? Yeah. I mean, Hume really thought we're not going to have those emotions anymore. Um, so I, OK, so Pride and Prejudice. I actually, I mean, she's a preacher's daughter, OK, <laughs> who doesn't care less how much money you have. And this is me, like I was just like that. Like, I don't care. Um, I even there's a, a guy in my life from way back, and we sort of have a lot of that, except we never resolved it. So I'm sorry, not all those stories end up good. <laughs> but um, Jane Austen does, she focuses on secular, she doesn't, it's not a religious thing, right? She's looking at people, how they actually relate to each other. And um, she is promoting humanist values, right? Yeah. No greed, marry on the basis of love, all that stuff. But she's also, you know, I don't know, you could say that maybe she's writing those stories in order to re-engineer, be part of that re-engineering project, right? possible or you could say well she knows this is always going to happen again and again um, but i'm yeah. not sure but the main thing is that if that was the motive or if enlightenment you know 
intellectuals use her for that, right? They would be teaching people to read her books in a certain way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And again, I tend to read it with the archetypes, introvert, extrovert, um, the same old, same old, but, but I think you could argue that it's, it's a part of a Hume type of education to cure people of these vices once and for all. Um, and then with um, Animal Farm, he did not think people were gonna be like that by the time Orwell was writing, right? Yeah. They would have all the kinks worked out by 1900. They would have a social science that would truly mold people to be, to not do that, not fall back into brutality. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, so I think Animal Farm is definitely a tragedy. It's using that kind of education, purgation. Like you could do this, guys. Don't do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. The story is really trying to scare the heebie-jeebies right out of you, but you have this capacity. And trying to get you to really identify with this. Don't think you can't go there. But I mean, Orwell is criticizing the Enlightenment folks that thought you really could re-engineer people and they would never act that way. Does that make sense to you, Leo? Yeah. Okay. It and it's especially, I think that's especially evident just in early, early uh, studies of psychology um, and the methods where everything was revolved around shaping and just yes. kind of training, training yes. the mind. Um, and then I think early studies in um, sociology and anthropology were kind of trying to take like regression from mathematics and be like, well, this can obviously work on people. Yes. And they all operate fundamental assumptions that like humans are rational um and and whether or not it's true it it doesn't really work that way well actually the assumption that you can mold people you can re-engineer the psyche so that they will habitually without a second thought act rationally right yeah. that was their project we're going to change the human playing field, right? We're going to re-engineer people for good. I mean, permanently. That's why you don't have to refer, you don't have to study history because we're not going to be like that anymore. Unless you want to study how barbaric people were in the past and how wonderful science and social science are, you know, if you want to use it as an advertisement for why we're so much better, okay. But otherwise, you don't learn from history. My God, we could do this. No. Yeah. OK. So um, and then with Winnie the Pooh, I read these stories to my kids. And um, it, I don't know the it's brilliant in terms of speaking to a kid about the things that they are afraid of, right? Like poo, right? I mean, they, they identify with poo, I think. Um, and there's a movie about Christopher Robin, about the real Christopher Robin. That's so fascinating, Leon. He, I think his dad, I think he was sick or something and his dad started writing these stories. And he was Christopher Robin, you know? And then everybody, they, it, they were so popular that as an adult or a youth, everybody thought of him as Christopher Robin. And it's just like, I'm not, you know, I'm a person. It was so aggravating because he was infantilized, right? And yeah. I think he ended up dying in World War I or something. It was really an amazing story. Um, true story, like this is what really happens 
to Christopher Robin. <laughs> if you want to check out that movie or something, it would be funny. Um, yeah. But the thing I remember is when um, he was walking around the a tree, I think, and he saw these footprints. It's like, oh, it's the heffalump. Oh, the heffalump is going to get us. And the sort of, the kid knows those are Winnie the Pooh's own you know, uh, prints, paw prints. And so the kid figures it out where Piglet and those guys are all so anxious. So the kid has this experience of being the person who knows, right? The, yeah. the adult and the person that isn't anxious in, a, in about a, a subject that a little kid would be anxious about, right? If there's some heffalump somewhere. So it really does speak to kids. That's that's what I, just their fears, especially. But also um, the Wizard of Oz is really good at that. Did you ever study that? I never studied the Wizard of Oz, but I have seen it a couple times, specifically when I was little. And it was the most terrifying movie I'd, movie I'd ever seen for most of my life. Oh, that's interesting because you know, it means the movie was poorly made because it didn't communicate. So it was, it was more so just the witch and flying monkeys. Those kids yeah, were I mean, creepy when they were young. I mean, really, Liam, what are kids worried about? They're worried about being heartless or people treating them in a way that's heartless, right? They're worried yeah. about that, not having a heart. They're worried about being cowards right? Being afraid. Yeah. And so the cowardly lion, I mean, it is amazing. They yeah. literally, the, the story expresses their fear. And then they see the tin man and the, you know, resolving that fear. It's very amazing, really. Um, but again, and I'm not sure Again, an enlightenment humanist might say this is really good childhood conditioning because it's going to make them humane, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think the person who wrote it, well, I mean, you could use that. You, I mean, even the most enlightenment utopian thinker will say children have fears and we do have to condition them out of their fears. And this story will do it, but there's a lot of other things you do. First of all, fix things so they don't have that much to be afraid of. So every child should have a middle-class life. You shouldn't raise kids in poverty because they get to be afraid all the time, right? I mean, that was clear, but- yeah. Once, even when you have a middle class, even you have the basic structure, just kids are so vulnerable and they're aware of it, that they're afraid. So you supplement that with these stories and sort of reassure them. So I can, I can see that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I honestly believe these authors probably had different agendas. Um, but to me, the ones that appeal to this collective unconscious, there's a book called The Art of Enchantment, Bruno Bettelheim, um, about how the fairy tales are, they're myths. And they're doing exactly what all myths are trying to do, is tap into the collective unconscious, the stuff that never goes away, and try to help people move into civilization. But it's not a permanent process um, if it's a fairy tale. Um, you know, and that, Liam, it's important that you know that the origins of psychology, sociology, they were exactly and, this complete rejection yeah. of the past. Because there's plenty of people that will pick up on psychology, even teachers, they don't know the background. 
And so they'll project all sorts of stuff into it, say, well, that's not really what psychology is. And I'm saying, yes, it is. Even if you didn't think so, and your teacher didn't think so, you need to know the origins of this because, because then you don't sell out to it totally, right? Yeah. Okay, just for example, I had a student who's taken a lot of psychology at Lyon. And I, again, I don't know, it's just one class it's just something. He said that the teacher was promoting social cohesion, right? That conformity, you know, we need unity, we need social cohesion. Well, Liam, <laughs> that's going to get you to authoritarianism really quickly, right? Yeah. Democracy yeah. by definition has to allow for patience with complexity and ambiguity, fairness to opposing points of view. You have to live with that. You have to be willing to live with it or you're not going to have a democracy. And so right in the Lion mission statement, <laughs> these are the characteristics of a liberally minded person. Plus, Jesus didn't promote social cohesion, right? He questioned the authorities. Socrates did it. Like all these heroes uh, were the very ones that threw a wrench in the system. They weren't socialized. They had a higher point of view from which to criticize and they undermined, right? They disrupted the status quo. It was just like, Ah, how can you say that? Does that understand? You understand that, Leo? Yeah. But the enlightenment view would be, yes, the goal of all our conditioning is social cohesion because it's going to be, to, that's the way to do it, to create this wonderful middle class. People don't have any vices. But that didn't work out. I'm sorry, you end up with fascism. <laughs> right? It didn't work. Like, can't we just kind of learn from history? Nope. <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, does it? I mean, you know more than I do. I only took, uh, what, six weeks of a sociology class. You didn't, I went through in the 60s. You didn't have to take anything you didn't want. So I'm kind of ignorant, really, about this. My so I, sociology is really just the economic overlap. I don't have that much experience in sociology. I just know the um, kind of a little bit of anthropology and really just research methods. So I, I don't think I'm that far ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but. It is important to know where the discipline with the method that it uses, what its mission was originally. And that was why they rejected the ancient field. Like we're actually throwing that whole thing out. Like it's a lie. It was created by powerful people to maintain their power. It's a lie, right? You know, those Catholic priests tell you you're a sinner and then they're gonna give you the solution to your problem, worship me, you know, pay your indulgences to me, really. They thought they made that up. They set up a society where people feel guilty and then they sell them salvation. <laughs> that, yeah. And then, you know, we're gonna have the enlightenment. We're gonna call all that stuff out. It's all a bunch of garbage. We really have, we can really condition people and with the sciences, we can give everyone a middle class life. With the social sciences, they will want to be middle class and it's going to all be peachy keen. And so in World War I, people were really freaked out. I mean, they really didn't think it would get to that, where you just have more powerful weapons of destruction, right? Uh, anyway, so. So um, that's, so just uh, another example of Hume. You want to look up, can you, you guys are better at this than me. How about Renoir? Um, pretty much yeah, anything.
R E N O I R. Oh, R E N O I R. Okay, so Pierre Auguste Renoir. Yes. Okay. Yes, I got him. Can you put it on a oh a screen share? Let me give you. Um, can I? No, that's not it. I the screen share function. I'll let you share. Right, multiple participants. So can you share? Can you find it? Yeah, hold on. Um, there we go. I think that should do it. Do you see it? The, ah, the... all right. Look, does that make sense? It's very humanistic, right? Yeah, the focus okay. on the... Um, I think it was, yeah, this one I immediately got drawn to because it's all about the interaction and the, the collective of the human, like the collective of the people, even though they all have their own separate little conversations and things going on. But they're in the park. They're not in church, right? Yes. On Sunday, you go to the park and you talk to people and mingle with people. You don't go to church and flagellate about what a sinner you are, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and they know that, right? They're very deliberate about this. That's why often, you know, when we look at it, we don't think about that because those are just not the issues in our day. Um, yeah. So there's Renoir, there's, um, how about uh, Degas, D-E-G-A-S? All right, right, the dancers, and he was pretty obsessed with young girls, unfortunately, but right, again, that's humanistic, ballet, yeah. okay. Then um, S-E-U-R-A-T, I think, Soro, the pointillism, yeah, that's the pointillism, right? Sunday afternoon in the park. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, to me, when you see a whole bunch of them, it just gushes. It just becomes super obvious what's going on. He also, yeah. point, pointillism was the study of um, vision and that we actually see in dots. So he was trying to imitate the latest scientific discoveries about the nature of vision, right? They were just really trying to follow through on science. And then, and then the art is a part of the social science of conditioning people for empathy and fellow feeling and wanting to have this wonderful middle-class life, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, well, we could go, do you remember that burger when I had those readings about burger and it was yeah. Modi, Modigliani and that um, the critic was saying, ah, her body has this eternal form and she offers herself up to the reader, blah, 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 blah. Do you remember that? Yeah. And I and Berger yeah, would I say, what? Yeah, I don't remember the name, but I I remember, I remember those specific words that she offers herself up for the for the viewer. Right, and and he was talking. There's a slight comment about what Renoir had said to him. He said, "I love buttocks." <laughs> but okay, Liam. This is refinement of taste, right? This guy, like Berger would say, he's a dirty old man, you know, calling himself a critic. This is bullshit. But this, he really is in this train, this plane of thinking, like Hume, that you are developing delicacy of taste about women's bodies and you're an aesthete, right? You just appreciate the shape and the, you know, blah, blah. 
Does, does that make sense that he really, that was this guy's sense of mission to cultivate yeah. delicacy of taste in relation to sexual drive, right? Yeah. You're not gonna be aggressive, you're gonna be delicate and you're gonna appreciate. <laughs> oh God. Anyway, and that's where those women deconstructionists sounds <laughs> like. The uglification, you know, they're just like, I'm not an object. <laughs> um, so they they would disagree and say, that is lust. I'm sorry, buddy. Don't deceive yourself. But the Hume types, the Enlightenment types would not think so. They really wouldn't. Um, okay, so the, actually, do you want to think of any other stories or plays? or music? Um, I think a lot of, oh God, I, I think I think Hume would hate, would hate so much music. <laughs> I think he'd hate, I think he'd call metal like just thrashing pans. Oh yeah, no, he wouldn't like that. He'd hate metal. I think he'd hate most, um, I think he'd hate quite a bit of folk music just because of its simplicity. But I think he might appreciate the, the history of it. Um, okay. I think, I think he'd be, again, I think he'd really just go straight for the classical music and everything well, else. Well, not he'd be all like, classical music, right? Not the, not the Russian. Not, not the Russian. Um, but there yeah. is the French. I mean, French music is very, yeah. uh, Debussy, I don't like this music. <laughs> But I think it fits with the yeah. end of, and France was a major player in the Enlightenment, right? Yeah. The French Revolution. Um, why don't you stop the screen share? And I can see your beautiful face better. Um, oh, I, anyway. I forgot that. I, I've been staring directly at you. I kind of forgot it was still going. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so I would say uh, Ravel. Debussy. say again I'm not a connoisseur I I don't know a lot of music but I know that I don't like it <laughs> yeah. it's too namby pamby but I mean that was the point um and it was during the romantic era and all this stuff um let's see so music um Oh, there were some plays written. Oh, and Hume talks about them, but I can't remember where they would write plays that were deliberately anti-tragic, right? Yeah. Where the character is refined and everybody can know that they took sign kind of some of the properties of tragedy, but they told a entirely different story about human nature because they're trying to condition people into this much more advanced view where you just forget <laughs> that other stuff. But you want to use the genre of tragedy, just the way it's organized or a plot line, and then deliberately have them not make a mistake. They don't make yeah. a mistake. Um, and they're weaving people together all the time. All right, so music, plays, visual, uh, stories. Yeah, okay, literature. I just don't know enough of the literature off the top of my head. But anyway, I, th I think you get the main point, right? Yeah. And it truly yeah. is. It's a radical shift because everything up to now is the artist has to have some profound insight into human nature and the human condition, right? Some yeah. grasp of some underlying reality that either enlightens you about your capacity for evil or your capa your capacity for good, but all every everything 
is more extreme than the sort of digestible veneer of civilization, right? Yeah. So there's the civilization is a veneer and there's something underneath that's both it can be better or can be worse. But excuse me, but Hume and the Enlightenment people said we're gonna make the veneer into the only reality. We're gonna make people good. Um, they're gonna get along. Um so let's see. So, okay. Oh yeah. All right. So suddenly all those people that advocated that you have to put yourself in a position of being able to, to understand that insight of the artist, right? And now Hume is telling the artists create something sensual that it just is what it appears to be there's no veneer of nothing it's like this is civilization people at the park and there's not going to be any big disruption and the evil you know ruining things there's not going to be someone raping someone at the park you know um so instead of the idea that this is what appears to be, you know, we all try to act like we're all civilized, but then, you know, in a cr critical moment, it's like, wow, no, you know, like, so the artist's job is to cultivate this delicacy of taste, just really make it visually pleasant make it auditorily pleasant so you just enjoy and always humane empathy uh, wanting to reach out to other people and then so the the real civilizing influence comes in the audience's reaction not you know the artist might have a completely different motive or might have the motive, but everything depends, the civilizing influence depends on the audience reaction, right? Whereas yeah. nothing before said it depends on what, whether you're a good artist or not depends upon how your work affects people, right? They would never say yeah. that because most people don't want the truth. <laughs> They don't want to think they're capable of those evils, right? So definitely now, do you remember when Kumaraswamy said, this is not an aesthetics, you know, he hates the aesthetes. And he just says, that's just sensuality. It's just shallow and trivial. There's, they deny this underlying metaphysical reality. It's like, yes, they do. <laughs> and this is Hume. He is perfectly describing Hume, and they just totally disagree. Um, yeah. Okay, so, and so it's the audience reaction, and then the critic reinforces that, right? The critic, critical analysis should never mention religion or any, you know, dark stuff. Just keep, keep engineering us. Ah, uh, yes, so much empathy. Isn't that great? And everybody should go to the park, <laughs> have fun on Sunday afternoon. And this is wonderful. And it's just, you know, triggers all these wonderful humane feelings. And so the critics would keep reinforcing that. And then that would go up to um, institutional structures and social science techniques and all that stuff. And that's civilization. So it's a really different vision of human nature, the human condition, and then the role of the arts. Does that make sense to you, Liam? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, Shakespeare 
lived in Renaissance England, and that was a humanism, a humanistic, right, trend. Um, so when it like um, uh, Romeo and Juliet, it's about getting over these prejudices and all that crap. But you could say that Shakespeare really did think we could get over it for good. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. Shakespeare, yeah, or Shakespeare might have thought we're just making this transition, right? From and so my plays are gonna try to permanently cure people of this horrible tribalism. Um, I don't know if he thought he could permanently do it. Um, but it would be understandable at that time in history, right? They would say, well, we're not over it yet because we're so caught up in all these rotten habits. But I'm trying to educate people to a better place, a more humane place. Um, and again, it's possible that people disagree on where Shakespeare would fall on that continuum. But also a director would perform a play with <clears throat> one of the agendas or another in mind, probably. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm not quite yeah. sure how the performance would be different one way or the other, but maybe it would just be why the director chose to perform that play because he thought at this point in history, we can really make progress on this issue. Um, I don't know. Does that make sense, Leah? Yeah. Okay. So, well, you know, Malvolio, like Shakespeare's comedies, they're just celebrating life, right? I, I did, whatever else is true of Shakespeare, I just think he loved people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, he definitely liked making them look foolish. But he loves them anyway. I mean, you know, it's yeah. not a cynical thing. It's he's trying to, you know, everybody can laugh and they can laugh at themselves and they can laugh at characters and, you know, really stop behaving in these stupid ways. It, you know, it's not like a morality play, like you're trying to beat people over the head, don't do this. It's just like a celebration of humanity. That's, does that make sense, Leon? Yeah. I, except the Merchant of Venice, you know, I just, I, I'm not quite sure about that one, right? The anti-Semitism, if he's, you know, I don't know, I don't wanna to touch it, frankly. But the comedies, they're so incredible. I mean, you go away just feeling, oh, people are crazy and stupid, except I love them anyway, right? It, does that make sense? It just makes you love yeah. people. And then actually, is it Twelfth Night where you have that character, life is a stage and men are the players? Do you know which Shakespeare play? Life is a stage. And men are only players, and then he has a seven. It's it's one of the comedies. I, no, it doesn't ring any bells. And, I mean, the it's, comedy of Shakespeare is Taming of the Shrew. Oh, and that which is yeah, and the, that's interesting too. You know, it's again, it's trying to humanize the shrew lady, right? Yeah, and I think you know. The, the net result is to get over dysfunctional marriages and like be more humane in your marriage, right? I think it's a humanizing play. Don't stereotype the shrew, she might be an actually a good wife. Um, anyway, so, so I guess that's enough for that. If you can just get how radically different this is. Um, and so yeah, many people coming want. From, yeah, coming from Kumaraswamy, it is flipping 
Um, are you using Hume to mark the shift or is he the introduction to the more modern takes? Like, is he the first that is going to be in a long line of people like this or is he just one to kind of mark the transition? Actually, in the way I designed the class, the two main ones, Hume is the one that focuses on pictures of people and cultivating empathy with people. And then Kant yeah. focuses on the pleasure we get from primary colors, primary shapes, and design. Not people, yeah. design. Does that make sense? And that's more, yeah. Hume, uh, Kant was a mathematician. And so that makes sense. The modern view of reason, rationality, is dualistic. It's not, you superimpose these categories. Well, in terms of the arts, you're, you're using your imagination, but you're using it as about as abstract a way as you can. It's not about people. It's about your sense, sensuality, your visual, your proportionate, right? Just like in math, you love the order of things, right? Yeah. You love this pattern order. Well, in art, you love these colors and these shapes, um, but people would get things too messy, right? <laughs> they're, they're messy, that's too complicated. Um, yeah. So those are the two, I use those two. And then I, I also were going to point out, well, then Hegel has another view, which is important. And then, then you have Tolstoy. They're starting to question the Enlightenment. And um, so there, there have always been these voices saying, no, guys, it's not going to turn out that way. There always was that alternative voice. But the Enlightenment just kept plowing through. Um, and yeah. people today, what I think is there are a lot of, I didn't realize this till at Arkansas and all this, but you can imagine a smart kid, but growing up with this very anti-intellectual religion and getting to college and going, ah, the Enlightenment. Oh my God, yes, we're going to save the world by facts. You know, and religion is awful. And, you know, I'm going to be humanistic and I'm going to blah, blah. I'm going to commit to social cohesion and I want to teach people how to use social science to make everybody good. I mean, they would be extremely motivated to do that, especially if they had a teacher like that. Today, right now, because of how many kids grow up in these extremely anti-humanistic, anti-science, religious cults, right? Yeah. All right, so we're, we do have these different strains in our society. Um, all right, and then we'll do the deconstruction stuff. I mean, eventually somebody comes along and says, both Hume and Kant are privileged white guys sitting in their offices cultivating delicacy of taste. <laughs> this is so limited. It, and they they think it's gonna work for everybody and that's just not, it's not remotely realistic. So they deconstruct blah, blah, that it, it, it's objective and universal and all this stuff, but that's where we're going. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. It should fit yeah. with a lot of other stuff that you study in other disciplines. And um, yeah. The thing, yeah, the thing about philosophy is that everything you study in your other classes has a philosophy behind it. And that's why I enjoy teaching the Western intellectual tradition because it gives you those philosophies. And so when you study this other stuff in other classes, which a lot of the professors don't even know, <laughs> They don't know yep. the history of this tradition. Like what was it reacting against? What was its position? Why was it very compelling at that time? And I mean, I, 
I still really like teaching and not because I agree with any of these privileged Western white guys, <laughs> but because it's still so dang powerful and it's powerful in the colonialism. Uh, anyway, so you can think about all that stuff and the place of the arts because the arts trigger emotions. They're not just theories. And so they really do affect real people. And if they affect their emotions, they affect their behavior. And so our attitude toward our emotions has a, you know, is gonna have a huge effect on our lives and our societies. Um, so that's why I like teaching philosophy of art. And I don't yeah. mind teaching the Western intellectual tradition through the lens of the arts. You know, that works for me. Um, but if you, their original motive for all these people was what they discovered about the sciences. So for Hume, his view of the sciences was that Newtonian physics, it claims to have these laws of nature that are universal and objective and logically consistent and all that stuff, right? And then he yeah. goes, he goes, okay, what's going to happen if I let go of this? And, and, you know, Kant would say it's the law of gravity. So there's nothing in this about laws. Like, it's physical, right? Uh, sorry, you, you cut out after, um, I forgot the words, for like the past 10, 15 seconds. So go back like 10 seconds. Okay. Well, you, you pull just, the pen. Hume says, look, you claim that science is about physical things. Physical things are not universal. <laughs> They're not objective. Like you see this pen differently than I do because I have a different point of view. Physical things, our encounters with them do not indicate that they that they occur according to some abstract laws, right? It's yeah. one thing after the other. And so Hume said that actually the sciences are just um, associations. They're generalizations from the associations we have when we observe this stuff. There's no laws. There's no universal blah, blah laws. There's just plain old stuff and, a, and recording our associations. First comes the letting go of the pen, and then comes the falling of the pen, right? And so that's where you get probability stuff, right? Because nothing is certain or necessary. Everything is just probable based on the observations we've done. It's an association psychology, an association understanding of what science is about. Does that make sense to you, Liam? Yeah. So then how does that fit with art? If we associate our, our interpersonal relations with all these humanizing right experiences, we will yeah. literally change human nature and everyone will have this association of psychology and we'll be done with it, right? Yeah. But when people go to church and get told they're sinners in the church, you know, they, they get this association that manipulates them and controls them and tells them these lies, and then the church keeps power, right? It's just association psychology. So don't go to church. <laughs> don't do that stuff. Do yeah. this stuff. And then you'll have a totally different psyche. Does that seem, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So in the West, if you really want to get to the root of it, you'd go to the science. But I don't mind teaching it starting with art and then yeah. going back. Incidentally, this came from the science because people care more about the arts than they care about yeah. science models and blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right, so there's all of that. Let me see. We have a few more minutes. So how about if we go through those questions? Did, did I already go through these last time? I think so, yeah. Because yeah, I, I, I think we did. 
yeah, the, the issue, I'm sorry that there's actually, um, uh-oh, <laughs> the cloud transfer thing never works for me. Um, yeah, I've been having trouble with it recently. Okay. Um, but mostly I just was lazy and I pretty much cut every place he said, talked about delicacy of taste and plugged one into a different question. But so it just gets a little redundant, except that it's not on accurate, inaccurate. It's just kind of not this again, <laughs> but it is that if you can get that, that that is the main focus and everything else sort of falls out from that and how radically different that is from where we, where he, what he grew up with. Um, dang, I know when I go to this, it never works because I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is not what I want. <laughs> um, all right. So yeah, it's too bad because it's on my Google Drive. It shouldn't do that. All right. Pull it up in the drive. See this one? No. Okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Over here is that? Yeah. Here we go. Let me see if I can. Um. Search. Okay. Oops. Oh, come on. Hume questions. Okay, here we are. Can you see this? Let me see. Wait a sec. How do I? It doesn't give oh. me. See if this works. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Standards of taste can be established empirically, right? By social conditioning by association psychology. Um, and the critic is just somebody that's had, what is it that makes you a good critic? It isn't that you understand the veneer of civilization and the passions that really drive us. It's that you've had enough experience of looking at the stuff and developing your delicacy of taste that you that's the association you have in your head and you have a whole history of these associations and you can teach other people how to rewire their brains and stimulate this empathetic associations and a whole history of empathetic art uh, exposure to it does that yeah. make sense Okay. Yeah. Art and non-art, species of beauty. Let's see. I mean, we went through this and I got toward the end and just said, oh, this is too much. Um, all right. So he compares the foundation of beauty with the practical sciences, right? Of all experience, right? How do people learn how to act well? Experience, right? And they say, yeah. oh, this is like that. And they associate, okay? So a doctor, oh, this patient has symptoms like that other one. And you're just associating stuff. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, although there's a wide difference in delicacy, that's just because of lack of experience. Um, you can actually get good at it. Yeah. Okay. A true judge. Um, so my one point, yeah, a progress in the arts is favorable to liberty. Like you can't be angry that people have leisure time. They might do de degenerate things, but 
This is our opportunity to rewire the psyche. That's just from leftover habits from the past. And if we just keep pushing for this delicacy and science and scientific inquiry, we will literally rewire our brains and we will really, you know, it'll be, it'll be great. <laughs> okay, religion, just keep the religion out of it, okay? Um, education versus manipulation. The good art critic educates the sentiments and tries to help other people do that. Art and ethics, this should make us more refined in our behavior and our emotions, art and reason. This, this refinement of taste enables us to use our reason whenever we like, right? Emotions aren't getting in the way of reason. They're different from reason, but they don't corrupt our reason if you're refined. Does that make sense? Yeah. Art and psychology, right? And that's, again, that blank slate. Art and truth. Um, so the truth is we're capable of this and that's the best expression of our humanity. That's okay. I guess that's enough. Do you have any other questions or comments? I don't really have any questions or comments. Oh, I think, remember. I think once I we get to con, I'll, we'll have a better. What? Remember, I. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. So we have seven minutes. OK, what was Homer trying to say? He had all these messages about the struggle between good and evil, right? Um, what did I add? <laughs> right. He just likes the way it sounded, right? Remember, he's the perfect yeah. aesthete. Does that make sense? He's exactly mm -hmm. the kind of person that Hume would have thought was great. Um, and Socrates did not agree. <laughs> uh, Plato's trying to teach his readers don't do this. This is how you lost your democracy. You denied that you were capable of this stuff and you went ahead and did it. Um, let's see, what's the source of the inspiration? Um, okay, so for Plato and the, and the ancients, it was the collective unconscious that they understand what it is most people repress. Um, but what does Hume say? What would a student trained in Hume's view of audience response think of Ion's public recitations? Uh, he would think they're great because they sort of put you in touch with your emotions and they make you appreciate the beauty of this, even though, of course, we don't have those emotions anymore. Like Ion didn't occur to him. <laughs> It's just that feeling, oh, Achilles, you know, just feeling. Um, and you're not associating it with any kind of behavior. Anything. You just enjoy an afternoon of wallowing in emotions. <laughs> um, let's see, Hume doesn't think the mind is grasped recurring patterns. He thinks the things in the past were all a lie. Um, he doesn't think we're going to face the same kinds of situations in the future. Um, he thinks he's contributing to social evolution. The Enlightenment really believed in that permanent evolution. Um, how do we show we're enlightened and progressive? What has Hume passed down to posterity, right? So yeah. there, really, there really is a quarrel between Plato and Hume, right? Yeah. And to some extent, you know, um, Collingwood, 
would accuse both Plato and Hume of actually being focused on audience response, right? Yeah. Plato really wants to educate people. So does Socrates. I mean, so does Aristotle. Um, they have a vested interest and they're writing a story that they want people to get the message of, even though they know a lot of people probably won't and they can't stuff it. They can't force feed it but it's pretty obvious who the good guys and the bad guys are in those stories. Um, where Hume also, audience response matters. It's just that what, what sort of state of mind does the audience have to be in to respond, right? And that's very different for Plato and for Hume. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So empathy yeah. for Plato is empathy with people who give in to very irrational, dangerous, destructive emotions. You can have empathy with that and then try to avoid it if the situation comes up. Whereas Hume, empathy yeah. is just focusing on our fellow feeling and golden rule and stuff. Very, very different idea of empathy and of humanity and all that stuff. Any other questions or comments? No, I'm excited to read Kant in, in a context that isn't ethics. Oh. Because that is, yeah. That's what I know actually, of him best. Oh, sorry, actually, you go. So I would say human is more like utilitarianism. That doesn't make it, well, I guess Hume has some idea of the higher pleasures, delicacy of taste, but not as sophisticated ideas as uh, Mill, right? Yeah. You don't have to have intellectual pleasures, but the pleasures of the imagination and the pleasures of empathy, like Mill wanted to build a whole society on empathy. So this would be Hume's view is, well, this is how the arts can contribute to that process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, th I think so. I think I think I see how Hume is, is utilitarian. Um, yeah. I don't know, for his, for most of his views, they kind of seem a little more um, exclusionary, which would make me think that he's kind of an, e more of an egoist. Who? But I think uh, Hume. Okay. But the um, Kant's deontological ideas, I'm interested to see how those are going to play into the his aesthetic theory. Okay. Well, the thing about, you really wouldn't want to accuse an enlightened person of being an egoist. Yeah. Although that's what Kumaraswamy says. It's just absorption in your own sensuality, right? But honest to God, their theory was empathy not yeah. egoism. You can't, I mean, they're trying to build this utopia and the utopia depends upon empathy. So it wouldn't be fair. And again, Kumara Sawami says, you can say whatever you want. That's not really going on. What's going on? And they would say, well, we're re-engineering people, right? We're re-engineering yeah. things. It hasn't been what went on before but we're gonna, people are gonna have a really enlightened view of what's in their interest, right? That's the key. Yeah. And that's utilitarianism is that the people would get a really enlightened view of the greatest happiness for the greatest number, right? Not just my own happiness. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you anticipate given what you know about Kant? Um, I feel like he is going to focus on beauty as beauty's sake rather yes. than um, rather than like beauty as a construct like something will be beautiful because it is and he's going to try and kind of extrapolate that from uh, like pieces that he knows and that he would view as beautiful but i feel like he won't take in too much account for another person's perspective on what could be beautiful and instead he will just rebuttal others yeah, because he's very specific about how you're supposed to use your reason 
um, in science and then the moral law, right? Yeah. Everybody has to respect human nature as an end in itself, not a means. And then everybody has to respect the goodwill. And, you know, I mean, he's, yeah. everybody's got to be on the same page with the same principles. Um, so, so you would think, yeah, whatever he thinks art is about, he would want everyone to be on the same page, right? Sorry, my laptop is on like 2%. Yeah, well, also you got to go to lunch. So um, that's nice though that you've studied Kant because Kant is the hardest one in terms of the language. And I, I do give yeah. a summary of his view with the language and all that. So, okay, so we recorded this, right? Bravo. Yeah. Good old Ivy, you're going to get it, Ivy. We finally remembered. Uh, Bye-bye. So Ivy's going to meet with me tomorrow, and that'll work. I'll just okay. talk to her about the stuff. All right, we'll see you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.